Mr. Combs. Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, uh, thank you for the opportunity to address this important session. Prior to my current role as CTO of EMC Federal, I served more than 25 years in federal government, primarily in the Army, DOD, and the intelligence community. So I echo the, the remarks of Mr. Issa um, about concerns with security. Uh, during my career in uh, government and public sector, I have personally experienced many of the IT challenges facing federal agencies today. Cloud computing is a buzzword of the day in IT, but the characteristics the cloud brings are what is important for federal organizations. IT environments must be flexible, on-demand, efficient, and resilient. Organizations must be flexible. Um, Organizations must change, and the IT infrastructures that support them must be able to keep pace. At no other time has it been more important to change our IT landscape. As organizations are experiencing unprecedented levels of information growth and are under constant pressure to deal with the cost associated with maintaining our legacy IT environments. Many federal organizations have already begun to build the bridge to the cloud by adopting some form of virtualization. In fact, virtualization has become the foundation of the cloud, and in my view, is a great enabler of cloud services across the various deployment models. Cloud computing is virtualization taken to its most logical extreme, creating the ultimate in flexibility and efficiency and revolutionizing the way we compute, network, store, and manage information. Cloud computing has the potential to make the biggest impact in IT since the development of the microprocessor, but it is not going to happen overnight. This will be a journey, but we will realize benefits at many points along the way. In the end, we will be able to provide organizations with much greater flexibility to ensure we can meet the demanding needs of our federal government. Many challenges and questions are yet to be fully answered, including acquisition, availability, performance, scalability, solution maturity, vendor lock-in, and of top concern, security. I have addressed many of these in my written statements, however, due to time constraints, I will focus on security. We have an opportunity to get it right with cloud computing by engineering security into the solution, not bolting it on as has been in the past. Admittedly, with cloud computing sophisticated automation, provisioning, and virtualization technologies, there is significant security implications. These risks require that we look at security in a whole new way. While perimeter and point security products will still be used by organizations, companies such as EMC and VMware are embedding security controls and security management in the virtual layer, creating an environment in the virtual world that is safer than the physical world today. Industry must continue to develop and deliver technology components that support centralized, consistent management of security across the technology stack. The level of transparency that cloud computing vendors provide is critical when utilizing private sector partners. While there is a lot of talk about service level agreements helping to satisfy federal security needs, SLAs alone are inadequate. The go government must take a trust but verify approach and cloud vendors should be required to provide the tools and capabilities to allow customers visibility into those clouds to ensure the SLAs are being met. Fundamentally, security must be risk-based and driven by a flexible policy that is aligned to the business or mission need. The need for common framework to ensure that security policies are consistently applied across the infrastructure is critical to successful risk management. That is one of the principal reasons that EMC supports updating the Federal Information Security and Management Act, or FISMA, important legislation that will update the law to enable more operational risk management. Technologies exist today to deliver private cloud environments inside federal organizations to dramatically improve IT efficiency and still provide the security required to protect sensitive information within the government enterprise. Multi-tenant federated clouds can be deployed where similar security um, requirements exist. However, pacing, placing information on a public cloud today should be limited to public facing information only, and then only if the providers can prove the level of auditing and protection procedures are implemented to deal with breaches of sensitive information. 
Ultimately, cloud computing offers great potential for reducing cost and increasing efficiency and transparency throughout the federal government. And federal departments and agencies should be encouraged to embrace that potential. I again thank the committee for allowing EMC and me to contribute to this important effort. Look forward to taking your questions. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony, Mr. Combs. Uh, Mr. Ganger? Is that correct, Ganger? Ganger. Ganger. Perfect. You ready? Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you for this opportunity to testify uh, along with the others. I'm a professor at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, where I'm also the a professor of electrical and computer engineering, where I'm also a, the director of a research fen center focused on issues like cloud computing and, and have been for over a decade. Um, I hope that my independent voice uh, from an elite educational institution can help with clarifying the issues being explored today. You've heard from a number of folks already today, and obviously uh, from the questions, uh, investigated the issues yourselves as well. Um, and I'll attempt to, to avoid being needlessly redundant, uh, but I will underscore a few important uh, points and raise a few new ones. Uh, as we've heard and as you've uh, read, uh, cloud computing is a buzzword for using others' computers uh, together with yet others uh, in order to achieve efficiency instead of doing everything yourself. Um, that it's a natural evolution towards a service or as a part of a service-based economy. Uh, it's in fact, uh, as Mr. Uh, Issa noted, um, it's a, a bit of a return uh, to the past in some ways. I won't get into the details of it now, but there's actually a, a good reason why it has gone back and forth a little bit as, as engineering uh, technology and economies uh, of scale have changed. Um, one aspect of the definition of cloud computing that I want to make sure doesn't get lost is the uh, differentiation between a private cloud and a public cloud. Where, which has to do with who shares the cloud. A private cloud is something that an organization does itself and might be shared amongst the sub-organizations of that organization. So in the federal government, imagine all of the agencies sharing a cloud um, as contrasted with a public cloud that might be offered to uh, many organizations to share uh, as, as is usually uh, thought of when one hears the term cloud computing because of the internet analogy of, of everybody being able to access the internet. Um, but the private cloud is something that, that we don't want to lose sight of because it's, it's going to play a part of uh, the approach that gets taken with the breadth of federal IT functions. Uh, in fact, this is another thing that, that was brought up earlier, the notion of, of moving to a centralized management site. Um, that's one step towards a uh, private cloud approach. And there are some private cloud initiatives that are, that are going on in the government right now. For example, the NBC of, uh, of the director, Directorate of the Interior uh, has some cloud computing functions. And there's also a, an activity called Nebula that NASA is uh, doing for scientific activities. Um, the benefits of cloud computing, uh, when done well, can be huge. Uh, we've heard a number of examples. Uh, I liked the example, uh, in particular, of IBM going from 235 data centers to 12. In my written testimony, I talk about several others, including HP going from 85 data centers to six. Uh, over the course of the last four years and reporting from that 60 percent uh, reductions in their data center costs across the board while at the same time increasing the amount of computing and storage that uh, that they're doing uh, so the savings are, are real and they're large um, as with most things your mileage may vary and this was brought up by multiple uh, multiple of you already um, and just how much you save is going to depend for example on how efficient the the function that you're moving was already. Um, and the efficiency of existing implementations of functions varies widely. And so naturally, the savings you're going to get is going to vary as well. Um, but one big benefit that I haven't heard talked about as much that, that you don't want to lose sight of as well is the, uh, the speed of deploying a new application. In the traditional model where you have to procure, buy, uh, deploy, set up a set of computers before you can even start to develop the application, uh, that you're trying to deliver. Uh, and that, that process may take uh, many months. 18 months was the example that Mr. Kundra used. Um, uh, comparing that to the notion of renting some computing utility and getting started right away, it's a, it's a sea change in terms of how quickly you can, you can move in a new direction. There are risks. Uh, it's natural to, uh, to address them. 
uh, it, with questions, which is why I started with the benefits. Security is a very natural one. It's very important in talking about security to not start from the mentality that doing it yourself means that it will be done perfectly. There are too many examples where that's not the case. And in fact, uh, having a collection of security experts try to do the job for a larger collection of people rather than having each of those people do it themselves makes a lot of sense. You get more ability to move forward quickly when you have the experts doing it for people rather than everybody doing it themselves. It doesn't mean that everything is going to everything is going to want to migrate to a central place, but it is going to mean that a lot of things are going to make sense uh, to, to do that kind of centralization. Um, Lock-in fears mean that standardization is going to be critical. Resistance to change is going to mean that change management and new training is going to be critical as well as centralized knowledge sharing uh, uh, portals um, and information sharing. And IT culture changes are going to mean that the IT staff are going to have to uh, be retrained to new roles as well. They're not going to go away. You're still going to need expert IT staff um, to manage the interaction between any given agency, for example, and the cloud computing uh, provider. Yeah, but their roles are going to change. They're going to move closer to the applications uh, folks. Um, the, but the potential is great. It needs to embrace, be embraced. I'm thrilled to see that that's, that that's happening. And uh, thank you for letting me be here. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much. And let me thank all of you for your, your testimony. Um, I guess I just want to ask all of you this question. And, and you can sort of answer it as briefly as you possibly can. What do you see as the greatest benefit and the greatest risk to the federal government in terms of cloud computing? And if you just go right down the line and sort of be as brief as possible. I, I see a couple of huge benefits. One, of course, we've talked about, which is cost savings. Um, but the other huge benefit, I think, is that the aggregation of data will allow, in appropriate circumstances, much deeper analysis of data when you think about how we're going to do health care in the future, for example, the ability to analyze a lot of data and see trends and other things could be hugely valuable to the government. In terms of risks, it really does come back to the things we've talked about, security, privacy, and reliability. We're going to be dependent on this cloud. And if you can't access this cloud, or if cyber criminals go after the cloud because the aggregation of data presents a rich target, or people don't have faith that the data in the cloud is both protected and not improvidently used by the cloud provider, we will lack trust. Yes, I think the uh, benefits of cloud computing are enormous, and that's why it's really taking off in the, in the private sector. And to look at those benefits, cost advantages, speed advantages, scale advantages, ease of use advantages, customization advantages, and not to be overlooked, tremendous innovation advantages. Because once people are on a cloud platform, you can easily develop new applications, you can deploy them instantly, you can share them with other agencies. If you look at risk, usually at the top of the risk is, uh, risk list is what this committee's focused on, and that is uh, concerns about security and privacy. Um, I think uh, there are great advantages to cloud computing, innovation, innovation of features and functionality, but more important, innovations around security, our ability to react much more quickly now to security threats. Um, there are great cost savings um, as well for the taxpayer. Um, as far as risk, I do think we right now are in the risk of trying to label cloud computing a certain way so that we we don't understand the security issues in it. We we label it and dismiss it based on, on labels versus really what the security requirements are for the environment. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I agree with all the comments that have uh, previously been stated. And, but the greatest um, benefit, I think, is speed to delivery of capabilities, like uh, Mr. Ganger uh, brought up. Uh, today, it takes far too long to implement new capabilities in organizations. With cloud computing, we can rapidly implement capabilities and therefore uh, keep up with the changing needs of the government. As far as the greatest risk, I got to go back to my intelligence community days. That's the loss of the information. In, in the intelligence community, in the Department of Defense uh, realms, that loss of information means the loss, can mean the loss of lives. In the commercial world, that loss of information could be the loss of intellectual property and lots of money. So uh, that's the greatest benefits and the greatest risk as I see them. Thank you. Um, 
I would say that the, the greatest benefit, as most have, have noted, is efficiency. Efficiency both in terms of cost and in terms of the ability to roll out a new application, a new e-government uh, approach, right, in each of, the, each of the individual applications that one wants to, to get started, um, both of those forms of efficiency. Uh, in terms of the, the greatest risk, I, I guess I'm going to depart from a lot of people uh, here and say that, that I would worry that the greatest ri risk is entrenchment and the difficulty uh, making a transition, uh, the difficulty that one has in making a transition from uh, a comfort level that one has with the way they do things currently to something very different. And given how widespread the IT functions of the federal government are already, we heard about 1,100 data centers, um, getting all of, all of those people around the idea of looking at cloud computing and seriously considering not doing it all themselves, it's a tough sell to, to do that with people, to get them to, to really seriously consider doing that. The security aspect, it's one of the concerns that will get raised, and there are legitimate security con concerns, but the technical security concerns, to me, uh, seem smaller than the entrenchment concerns that will be rallied around, for example, the security word. All right, thank you very much. Uh, now you have five minutes to the uh, ranking member from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ganger, I'm going to follow up with you as the honest broker. Uh, 1,100 data centers. In your opinion, is there any reason that this committee shouldn't drive the bureaucracy toward, let's say, 200 data centers and force people who have eight, like GSA, to have eight that are co-located within those 200 centers, and wouldn't that represent billions of dollars in savings and a consolidation toward a private cloud? Which is the second question since you're writing, which is, aren't we big enough at $80 billion worth of total IT services, tens of billions of dollars worth of specific software support, and, and uh, 20 billion worth of infrastructure support? Aren't we big enough to own our own cloud? Uh, I don't want to quote, but I will, the Rolling Stones, 1967, when they said, get off of my cloud. But why, why would we get onto somebody else's cloud to begin with? Why wouldn't we say we're big enough to go alone or to be co-located with other locations but have complete segregation so that security is designed in from the door on please okay so i'll try to, to take them in the order that you gave them so um no 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 take them in the order best for you okay so do you drive data center reductions um i don't have a lot of insight into what the 1100 are doing it would shock me to hear that that an analysis of the 1100 doesn't doesn't lead to being able to do 200 for example yeah. Right. Well, earlier but testimony, it took a long time to find out how many they had and where they were in yeah. some cases. Which means, by the way, that it's going to take you know, longer to do the, the consolidation than, than one might hope, right? Because there's going to have to be a lot of learning about what functions those different data centers are doing in order to make, it, to make a consolidation actually work. Yeah. But, but just, just shared bandwidth, efficiency, uh, in, uh, facilities, uh, advantages, all of that would be in the hundreds of millions of dollars, Huge enough advantages. to pay for the consolidation in a short period of time. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Huge advantages to be had there. And, and I would be really surprised to learn that that, that type of consolidation couldn't be done um, and that those advantages couldn't be realized. The corporate world has done it, and we've seen two examples of large, very large corporations that have, have gone from uh, two and three digit numbers of data centers right. to single and, and 12 was the second example, right, numbers of data centers. In terms of uh, is the government big enough to do a private cloud, there's no question the government is big enough to do a, a private cloud. Um, the question that you'd have to ask yourself isn't whether you're big enough to do it, it's whether you have the expertise to do it for all of the different types of cloud technologies that you might need to do it for. Um, okay. Well, I'm going to so move to the cloud folks here uh, for a moment. Mr. Burton, uh, you offer a public cloud solution that's already purchased by agencies of the government. And they buy a product as a COTS product, basically. So that can proliferate with vendors offering them. And the only problem, of course, is certifying that the data they put onto your cloud uh, is, in fact, safe, secure, and so on, right? Would you say that there are things like Mr. Combs might mention the NSA or the CIA that never really should be customers of yours, at least not with the same computer in the same location that's dealing in the clandestine world. 
Yes, I think without a doubt, not only in the federal government, in the private sector, there are certain data sets that are so secret, so sensitive, that they will never go on to uh, a multi-tenant cloud. There's a company in Atlanta called Coca-Cola, I suspect, there's at least one formula you'll never host. Mr. Uh, Tarney, yes. uh, in light of that, won't there always be some private computing facility-based like some of our labs activities where even the hard drives have to be removed between uses and so in a sense isn't this committee looking at the migration of public private and legacy with an inevitability that one size doesn't fit all i agree with that completely i mean there'll be cases where organizations government agencies want to run an on-premises system and control it very tightly like some of the intelligence communities communities, there'll be places where the government's a community of interest and can share a cloud, and there may be places for public information that a public cloud service is not a big concern because it's information you want to share anyway. The key is customer choice and mapping the cloud model to the risk model. Mr. Bradshaw, I understand that you're a super salesman, among other things. Uh, you'd like to sell as much of your product as you can, I'm sure, but wouldn't you also agree that there is a segment that could be moved sooner rather than later to public cloud, a segment that needs to have that transition, and then a segment that will never, in the foreseeable future, make that transition. I, I absolutely agree with that. We've aimed our initial offering at the uh, sensitive but unclassified level it, to meet that or exceed it, but we do agree there are some things that we would not recommend you move to the cloud, the public cloud. And I'll close with one thing on behalf of the chairman and myself both. Isn't one of the challenges to a truly transparent cloud when it's pointed toward the public, that portion of cloud computing, the fact that all of our various government agencies have failed to have standards that are interoperable and easily uh, searchable uh, so that you, uh, you can know that a name or a particular cell in a database will in fact correspond? Uh, not not just, but including websites. Um, I I do believe it's very difficult to put standards in place that meet the requirements of all the individual agencies and individual bureaus within the agencies, um, and take advantage of of information technology at the same time. That is a big challenge. But I do think we can use the current um, regulations that are in place, get a great understanding of how things compare, and then. All of us are security. Um, we have security experts in our company. Let's take advantage of those and work with you to continuously update these through continuous monitoring and things like that. Thank you. Anyone else before the chairman reclaims my time? Thank you all. Thank, thank you very much. Um, and now you have five minutes to the gentlewoman from California. Thank you. As I mentioned in my opening statement, in the light of the recently reported uh, cyber attacks involving China and other nation states, I'd like to hear some specifics from each one of our vendors and uh, about how we would protect our particular systems. And uh, I'd like specifics on how your companies plan to demonstrate compliance with uh, the requirements on a regular basis, and I'll just like you to go to go down the line, and then um, I'm going to ask, since we're not going to have time within this session, to hold additional hearings in our subcommittee, uh, how you would provide uh, this information, and would you give us kind of a summary uh, in writing to our committee, and then we'll submit that to your committee. So just tell us uh, in your own words about what you as an individual uh, vendor would do to protect the security, cybersecurity. Yeah, I think there are really two parts to the question. First, yeah. in terms of how we protect security, the real key is having a documented information security program that looks at the assets you want to protect, what the threats to those assets are, and then you build and test a set of controls to protect those assets. But the China question is a little bit difficult in the sense that one of the th changes we have seen 
over the last 20 years is a major change in the threat model. When I was at the Justice Department prosecuting cyber crimes in 1991 and 92, at the beginning of my career there, a lot of the hackers were young students exploring networks. Now we have what we call the advanced persistent threat. We see more and more nation state activity on the internet. We see more organized crime activity on the internet. We see a black market for vulnerabilities. A regular documented information security program that might be adequate for most commercial purposes may not be completely adequate for an advanced persistent threat. And this is why, for example, as I said earlier, I don't think the intelligence community should be parking its information on even public or shared tenant clouds. The advanced persistent threat is going to require a much more careful analysis and different cybersecurity strategies. I've, in fact, written a paper on this very point and would be happy to share it with the committee. Thank you uh, for that question, Chairwoman Watson. Um, security is something that our smallest customers take very, very seriously. Whether you're a corner pizza uh, store maintaining your customer data or a multinational bank or healthcare company or an agency of the federal government, unless yeah, we let, provide... Let me uh, be more specific. Mm -hmm. How do we have assurance that our federal information within your systems uh, can be protected? And yes. I know this is not the place where you can give uh, direct answers, but just... I'll, I'll respond to that. So, so uh, e each of our customers uh, can uh, come in and do security reviews with Salesforce, and, and they do not go onto our platform until they're satisfied with our security. We uh, comply with major international security standards, ISO uh, 27001, SAS 70 Type 2, SysTrust, all of those are available. We feel that without trust, no one is going to use Salesforce. So we have a site. Anyone can look at it. This committee can look at it, trust.salesforce.com. And if you look at that site, you can see what the performance is of our system every single day. I looked at it this morning. We processed 315 million transactions yesterday, each one in about 300 milliseconds. On that site, you can see the types of security attacks we're facing. You can see all of our credentials. If you want to lock down your security, it provides you who to talk to, how to get at that. And so we feel that not only security standards, but transparency is critical to the whole cloud model. And that's why we have this trust site that's up, uh, available for anyone to look at. And I think just the one question to come back really, I think, to a, a comment Mr. Issa uh, raised, is yes, there are some data sets that are so sensitive, so secret, that they should be kept uh, outside of a cl cloud environment. But I think if you look at the vast majority of the data that the U.S. federal government processes and stores, it falls into a lower level of security, and I think that's perfectly adequate for a strong uh, vendor with good security to manage on a multi-tenant platform in the cloud. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Google has made a commitment at the executive level of the corporation to meet federal security requirements. Uh, we've completed and submitted our, um, uh, to the government our FISMA certification package and we're waiting to hear. We do meet the security and privacy requirements that we have, that are laid out in the federal statute under FISMA and we uh, make those findings available uh, upon request. I think what we also do, we are so focused on security, we all know this is a growing threat for everybody. We look at two areas. One is reducing the threat, um, the threat environment. Um, yeah. So we are very focused on bringing down things that have been exploited in the past, trying to limit that, lim limit the doors that have made these threats um, possible. And then also looking about moving some appropriate data to an environment where we can take our security professionals and we can take just multiple layers of security and protect that data for you. Uh, you're so out there, that's why I mentioned Google, because I say to myself, would you Google that, please, quickly? <laughs> and uh, we know the problems that uh, all of you are facing, so I just want to get some ideas how you are addressing them. Mr. Combs. Thank you, ma'am. Um, today's security architectures are nothing more than a broken safety net of point security solution products. We have to move from point security products to an information-centric approach to managing our data. 
It's all about two things. It's about identities. Those systems and processes that either need to have access or be restricted access to our resources and the information. That information must be either available or restricted, however an organization's policies defines. That gets into your second part, which is government risk and compliance. What we're doing at EMC is we are, we've acquired technologies and we're further developing them to allow portlets for organizations to look inside our cloud offerings and to ensure that we're providing the 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 government the risk the, the government the risk and compliance capabilities that matches their requirements. Thank you. I'm not a vendor. <laughs> what I'm going to uh, advise my staff to do is send letters to all of you, and you can respond to the questions that we have in your letters. So you'll get something, uh, and uh, we'll try to do it as soon as possible. Thank you so very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time. Thank you very much. Um, I now yield to the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chafee. I like the enthusiasm, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you all for being here. I, I appreciate it. Uh, full disclosure, I think I've been a consumer of all of your products and services with the exception of the parallel data lab. I can't think of something that, although you probably have something I've, I've consumed along the way, but uh, all, all with great success. And you're obviously market leaders and, and, and we appreciate your, your perspective here. And, and we won't do it justice in the five minutes. So if there's additional information you want to share with us, please know that we will we'd love to have you follow up on that. Uh, Mr. Bradshaw, start, starting with you, if I could, in your written testimony, you say, quote, the most important component of feeling comfortable with one's data in the cloud is trusting a cloud services provider and the practices and policies they have in place, end quote. Ronald Reagan famously said once, trust but verify. How does that work in a government type of model? Because in, in, in the second part of my question is just, how does a Google, which is so unique in all the world, how does your business model fit with government types of services where you've you know, relied a lot on getting a lot of eyeballs and then converting those into to advertising dollars? How does that work in a business model with the federal government or state government? But going back to this, okay, it's great to say, hey, trust us, that's the most important thing, but how do we gain a comfort level that that information is secure? Anyway. Um, I, I agree with you on that. First of all, I'm in a group called Enterprise, which is a separate division, um, a separate group from the consumer group you're very familiar with. We actually look at the consumer products and determine how we can change them so they fit into a government or into a commercial environment. So the products are slightly different and they're modified for that reason. Um, as far as trust, we understand this is the biggest thing for you on security and privacy. So we try and be as transparent as possible. Um, I think sometimes, um, you know, we we make sure we put something out in a blog as soon as we find it um, so that you will understand what kind of problem we have. I think the benefit of that to you and to me as well is that the technology allows us to very quickly react to some of these attacks that we've seen, um, look at the situation and then correct it um, and immediately make that fix available to a lot of people. So again, this is where the innovation just really plays um, to this increasing threat model we're all seeing. And, that, and that's where I think one of the interesting questions going forward is how do those um, cloud-oriented companies and in their business model, how do they make that work? And, and we'll have to explore that further. The GAO in their report has reported that 23 out of 24 agencies identified multi-tenancy as a potential uh, information security risk. Do you find that, is that baseless or is, is that something you would concur with? And, and I don't concur with this. I think we have many examples where we have multi-tenancy um, tenant um, application solutions that we use and we're very comfortable with them, such as an ATM, um, you know, a banking system where m multiple people are in the same system. We're very comfortable with that. I think the government has several examples where they have solutions they've been using for years where they are multi-tenant. Um, so I think you can gain so many benefits from this environment, again, because we are putting the data in one location and we're putting multiple layers around it. Sorry, Mr. Mr. Char Charney, if we can, uh, how would you address that, this, the GAO so, uh, concern? So I think multi-tenancy can be fine, but I think it also raises um, different threat models, and the ATM analogy is not quite right. 
And the reason for that is I can go up to an ATM machine and put in my card and take out money. And it may be true that my account is stored with other accounts, but the ATM is not a platform on which I can load software. There has been some research done where academics have basically hosted in the cloud applications designed to attack the rest of the cloud. And with multi-tenancy in that environment, virtualization becomes key to separating the data. And so it doesn't mean multi-tenancy is dangerous. What it means is it presents a different threat model, and you need to make sure you're mitigating those threats. So what are those technologies that ought to be highlighted in terms of differentiating I think there are a few things. The key thing, of course, is that you have secure development of the virtualization technology, that the people who are developing that technology are trained in security, and that they use good development practices into security to make sure that the containers that are built through virtualization are, in fact, robust. Do, do we possibly have enough personnel in order to achieve that? I mean, it's hard enough to to hire as it is in, this, in some of these specialized fields? So for many years ago, when Microsoft adopted the security development lifecycle, we took the view that basically keeping it to ourselves for competitive advantage was the wrong approach. We decided that what we needed to do was share our best practices. And what we did was we published books on threat modeling, on secure code development, and on the security development lifecycle itself. And we publish some of the tools we use in Visual Studio, which is our product for developers. And we've also made tools publicly available, like our threat modeling tool. We believe that there are not enough well-trained security experts on the planet today. And it's something the government can help address as well. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I could spend hours with each of you, but uh, thank you for your time and appreciate any follow-up. Thank you. I'd like now to yield five minutes to our distinguished member, Mr. Bill Bray. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to follow up on my colleagues' comments about this exposure of, I guess it was 23 out of 24. Um, that really kind, of, really kind of makes us focus on the tasks at hand when we've got that kind of exposure. And again, would like to follow up by asking, you know, why you think we have these risks, but more importantly, what can we do to address these risks and, and, and try to avoid impact by them? Basically, how do we armor the system and protect the system? So I, I think in part there's a lot of concern because the technology is new and evolving. And therefore, we're not familiar with the risks. And undoubtedly, what will sometimes occur is we'll learn new things along the way. And I think there's a natural and healthy tendency to say, I need to protect my data. And I may put it in this new environment that has these new threat models that I don't fully understand. The way to address that is through transparency. That is, that the cloud providers need to be transparent about how they run their operations and manage their information security program, and governments need to be clear about what their requirements are so that both parties to the transaction get greater comfort level with both what they're trying to protect, what they think is needed to protect it, and whether those controls are in place. Okay, but before you go on, let me just say, Madam Chair, it's kind of uh, just reminding me of when I got here in 95 and the leadership was changing after 40 years that there was a whole lot of members of the previous um, majority they actually were terrified at the concept of having internet between offices and among offices because they were worried about security i mean literally that was the, right. the you know the the fear at that time of course at the same time we were still delivering buckets of ice but uh, you know seven, you know uh, 95 years after the invention of refrigeration but that fear was there even among members of Congress as late as 1995, and I'm sure it's been much more recent than that. Mr. Burke, right. you had a question? Yes, a I'd, I'd very much like to comment on, on that question. Uh, Multi-tenant cloud computing is a mature technology. Salesforce has been doing this since its founding uh, 10 years ago. And you have major banks, major healthcare companies uh, running uh, mission critical applications on this platform today. Gardner says 25% of all new software sales are gonna be software as a service cloud computing next year. So I think while there are issues to consider, it's a mistake to say this is new, this is unproven, this is untested, don't go there. This has been tried and proven successful in the marketplace. 
I think the key question about multi-tenancy, the key question about security is know your vendor. Does the cloud provider let you do uh, deep security uh, reviews? Does it uh, have international security standards? Uh, does it have transparency and trust so that you can go in and see what's going on? And I think that as government agencies start exploring this, they will find that in fact there are some cloud providers that provide that today. There are lots of others who don't. There are lots of, uh, of issues. Uh, we're going to be discussing this for some time. But I don't want this committee to leave with the impression that somehow multi-tenant cloud computing is not tested. It's not, it's, it's new. It, it's not to be trusted. Uh, because I think the marketplace has already ruled on that and the marketplace is moving in a major way towards this new platform. I, I also would like to point out, I think something like FISMA provides a great way of evaluating the current systems we have against this new technology right now. So we can take a look at, at what we're facing with the current environment and put it right next to what we get, what benefits we get from it. Um, FISMA has independent audits in there. We have that third party audit. So it gives you a great way of looking and comparing the system to what's available to you right now. Why do we have why do we have these risks? There's no doubt that our adversaries can penetrate our networks and gain access to the resources that we have. Um, Chairwoman uh, Watson, you brought the Chinese up in your opening statement. It's absolutely proving time and time again that we cannot stop our adversaries from getting into systems that are available on the open internet. We have to, this is why I say that moving information into the public cloud should be limited to the information that is public facing information. Uh, the internal information, the engineering, the intellectual property, the sensitive um, um, information that exists in our government needs to be protected behind appropriate security measures um, to prevent us from getting into big trouble. Uh, you will have the uh, last comment and question, and then after that, uh, we'll be adjourning. We have uh, two votes, or three votes, uh, as I understand, at 2 o'clock. And, and I'll be brief. Mr. Combs, uh, in the compartmented world, the term compartmented exists for a reason. Would you briefly, in light of a multi-tenant environment, if hypothetically all of government was all on the, in the cloud and because of government to government requirements interlaced, what would happen to the historic compartmenting that we rely on in, uh, in the intelligence world? Today. Mr. Mr. Issa, um, there's ways to bring cloud computing into those environments. Uh, the consolidated data centers that are going on within the Director of National Intelligence today, uh, these are similar um, security requirements across the intelligence community. We can develop and deploy private cloud environments in a multi-tenant environment that will allow the, sec the security um, controls to be protected in that environment. Uh, across NASA, NASA is going through 110 data center consolidation right now. Uh, but it, much of their engineering processes today are similar, yet they have 110 separate data centers. Um, no, I, still I, mean, I think you've answered the question. Okay. I, I want to be brief for the chair lady. Uh, Mr. Bradshaw, responsible disclosure when companies discover uh, flaws in each other's software. Uh, does your company have a stated policy for how that's to be done? We, uh, we do make um, uh, security and privacy statements. Um, we, we definitely um, try to be as transparent as we possibly can. No, that can. wasn't the question, sir. Uh, all of the software companies uh, that interact get access to each other's various portions of each other's source code and, and interface with it for purposes of, of uh, porting software, uh, going back and forth with databases and so on. Does your company, does Google have a responsible disclosure policy as to discoveries of opportunistic or whatever uh, failures, security failures? How do you inform uh, 
son or somebody else that you found something that would be a vulnerability to the outside world if it were discovered. You have teams of software producers, as does Microsoft, as does Salesforce. How, how do you, what is your stated policy or do you have a stated policy if a software engineer discovers a vulnerability in somebody else's software? I can't personally state the, the policy, but I will be glad to get that back to you. If you'd respond to that for the record, actually, if all of your companies would, it's an area of deep concern to me, uh, mostly because I understand the Chinese are out there trying to penetrate us. I find it interesting that sometimes the penetrations end up in blogs, and they really come from software engineers employed by competitors. And uh, as long as we're buying from all the companies, the one thing we don't want is a vulnerability created at our expense in a competitive environment. So if each of you would respond to the extent that it's appropriate to your company. Uh, let me ask uh, that each of you will respond in writing. We've all framed the question, uh, if that's yeah, all right with be you, great. because I, that's a vote. Okay, and I've got one and, closing one only for the record. Uh, quickly, please. And it's for Google. Uh, the Presidential Records Act requires that we capture all emails of the president and their entire uh, agency or an entire the office of the president. Uh, could you respond for the record of how you're capturing Gmails that are being used in and around the White House by White House personnel? Uh, I'm in a group, again, that sells a product to the federal government, but it's not the Gmail system, the personal Gmail system. In our group, in our organization, we, we have a tool that allows you to do e-discovery as well as archiving for, for our mail product. Uh, well, I was, and I was talking about specific examples of what, it, what is going on uh, relative to uh, public use of the public Gmail. So if you could respond okay. for the record. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much for your questions, Mr. Issa. And I want to thank the witnesses for your testimony, the time that you have spent here. We're sorry for the interruptions, but this is the Congress, and we do have to go to vote. Thank you, audience, for hanging in here with us. The meeting is now adjourned, and we will put uh, our comments and questions in writing to you. Thank you.